Welcome everybody to HR Unplugged episode nine. We're going to talk today about building a highly productive culture with hybrid work. And we're going to talk about remote and we're going to talk in person. We're going to talk all the things today. Uh, before we get started, wanted to let you know that coming up on October 18th, we'll be back to our normal schedule and we'll meet up again the week after next and be on the every other week uh, schedule. We're really excited about our Slack community, so be sure you get registered into our Slack community and we can answer your questions. We can have conversations. Sarah just posted the link in the chat, so join us there. And then we're actually live on two podcast platforms, so you can catch all of our past recordings. And if you can't be here with us live, you can get caught up with us both on Apple and on Spotify. So please don't hesitate to, to check things out there. And then just like usual, these, these episodes are built for you. So send we're sending out the survey at the end of this and give us your feedback. Every response is read by the whole team and we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll be getting everything designed around what's most important to you. And with that, we'll get started here with my fabulous co-host, Vanessa. Excited to welcome Vanessa back. And let's do it, Vanessa. Let's talk about hybrid work. How, how do you like to work? How do you like to work, Vanessa? Are you in person? Are you hybrid or are you remote? I, I personally love the hybrid because I like my little office space, but being alone, I like to be in office so I can have human connection. So the hybrid model was like perfect for me, but it depends on what I'm working on too. That makes sense. That makes sense. Vanessa's got this new stellar background. I'm super jealous about it. It looks really good. Yes. And then I love when I'm in office and Vanessa is and I go behind her in office desk and grab snacks. She has a whole bunch of great unhealthy treats that I appreciate it too in the afternoon. Um, so even if she's not there, the treats are. And I'm super grateful. <laughs> I will always justify an unhealthy diet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. thank you, Anita. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited to dive into this topic. And you know, as we as we get going into it, I I would love to hear where is everybody calling in from? Uh, because I I I just love that question we asked last time and just seeing where everybody was coming from. Okay, Canada, Texas, Maine, a lot of Texas. Oh, Juno, Alaska. No. I love I love Juno, Alaska. One of my favorite spots. Really? I've never been. Is it? It's how long ago did you go? It's a, well, that was my first job. I'm this is one of my three truths and a lie, so you can't use it against me. But I worked on a cruise ship in Alaska. Oh, no way. Yeah. So I was in and out of Juneau every seven days. It was fantastic. Alaskan brewing, some of the best beer on the planet. Oh, wow. See, I'm just this is what I love. I was I'm learning all these little golden nuggets, you know, about you, Anita. <laughs> <laughs> I have to not give them all up at once. So just one an episode. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for, for jumping in. It's really exciting to, to see all of our friends all over the place and be able to dive into this really fun topic. Uh, building a better hybrid work environment has been a topic of discussion for a while now. And after the pandemic, it seems to be a bigger topic and focus for more and more companies. It's definitely top of mind. So before we get a take from you, Anita, let's check in with the live audience today with a poll and get a sense of how everyone feels about working remotely versus in office. So, so audience, like what, if you had to pick one for the rest of your life. There's there's two parts. A lot of pressure, Vanessa. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's there's two parts for this this question. The first one, if you had to pick one for the rest of your life, if you had to choose, do you thrive more working from home or in person? So you have to choose one. And then the second part is, what is the current setup at your organization? Is it in office only? Is it hybrid? Is it fully remote? So go ahead and type in there what, what it is for each of those. I'm really interested to see like what the, the differences are there. Yeah, it's coming in kind of as I thought, right? We've got about 50-50 at home and in person. Well, not quite, 63-37. And then hybrid is the clear winner set up, you know, which is the most complex, I think. It's hard to win in hybrid for sure. So yes, this is a good topic. 
well, it was designed by all of you. So we're not going to take credit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you all for giving us the content. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Anita, what do we know about hybrid work environments in 2022? And what can you tell us about the state of things right now? What do we know? We don't know anything. That's what's hilarious about it. It's been two years and I don't think anyone really, um, yes, Nick, we'll talk about that. What do you mean it's hard to win in hybrid? We'll talk about my perspective there. I think my general perspective is that no one knows the answer and I don't think anyone's doing it super, super well. I think we're all struggling through it just a little bit. So I think that's just the first thing I want us to acknowledge on this call is that hybrid work is still new. No one seems to have gotten it right. And establishing a productive hybrid culture is an iterative process. And we will see that today. Oh, yes, we can share the stats from our vote. Yes, how do we do that? Let's see, share results, that's how we do that. Oh, there it is, okay, so everybody can see it. So you can see about 63% um, feel that you thrive working at home, um, about 37% in person, and then the current setup at your organization is about 70% hybrid which is kind of what we're seeing, this blend of at home and in person. There still are a number of companies that are 100% fully remote. And so that that is working too. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, Vanessa, to your question is that leaders, you know, really like being in person. That's some of the statistics that we're seeing. Um, you know, it seems like we have this big shift, though, because 40 percent, sorry, 46 percent of the workforce is relocating because they can now work remotely. Right. So we have people going to live where they've always wanted to dream. They could live and work from anywhere. And yet, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think leaders are genuinely afraid to ask people to come in. I mean, here we've got this other stat that 35% of employees would be more likely to search for a new job if they were required to return to the office full time. So what this tells us, Vanessa, is as we've been watching this unfold, we've been living it ourselves, is that no one really knows the answer. There's fear on both sides. And it seems like hybrid is winning, which means you have to be excellent at in-person. You have to be excellent remote. And um, you're stuck in this hybrid. And if people are gone away somewhere and you wanted to be in person, that doesn't always work. So there's this, we got some pre-questions from our UK fans where we talked about where is the accountability? You have somebody, you know, that's supposed to be in and then calls in sick. So we're going to get into all the meaty middle here, right, Vanessa, and, and really mm -hmm. unpack all the things. Yes. And I love that too, because that's like during the pandemic, that was a huge conversation, uh, even, even with candidates applying to different companies of how, how is your company going to be set up and how am I going to feel socially connected with others when I'm there, if it's hundred percent remote and we're still kind of working through that tangledness. Yeah. And this is why I love Vanessa, your perspective on this, because, you know, you, you get to see it on the front line, you're recruiting, right? Mm -hmm. So you get to see what candidates are asking about. So get all your questions in for the frontline recruiter view and Vanessa will be able to tell you what it's like out there. Yep. I got your back when it comes to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's dive into uh, the, the best practices for hybrid work. I feel like this is like a really big meaty topic uh, with hybrid work. And what are some of the basic things companies should do or have in place to support that hybrid work? Yeah. So I'm going to give you three things that I think you have to do to set it up. The first one is what are you doing? right? And do leaders support it? Because oftentimes we create these programs and leaders are like, I don't want to be remote. I don't want to be hybrid. I don't want to be in person. Pick your poison. Have a, have a certainty that your leadership is bought in and supporting the philosophy that you're creating together. If leaders haven't bought, it, bought into the philosophy, they have private opinions and they're holding back because they're afraid of losing people. Or maybe like me, you know, I I have two little kids. I love the flexibility of hybrid, right? I had one homesick from school this morning. If I had to go in this morning, it would have been a big hang up for me. So, you know, I think it's important that we as leaders of teams and of departments and of organizations are really forward about how it works for us and how we work best and how we want to design our teams. 
Number two is don't change things that have already worked. I mean, our engineering teams, for those of you in tech, have always been remote. For those of you in the trades, you've always been in person. I don't think those things are, are, are moving. So I think you have to be open to looking at what's always worked. And there's some static quos that we need to keep static for the good of the work. And the third thing is be very precise in how you communicate, especially with your commitments. Like in a written environment now, we have to be excellent at writing. We have to be really clear on what we're agreeing to and what we're not agreeing to. And state where your company is at, honestly. If your company hasn't settled on a position, then say that. If your company is swaying one way or another or is leader-led, say that. Work from home means different things to different people. You need to establish commonality and what success looks like working from home. You know, does working from home mean work from anywhere? You know, a lot of companies are having these issues around setting up different countries and different states and all of the legalities that go around with that. So it's important that you get really specific around what you are and are not doing as an organization. Well, let's dive into the, the I know you kind of talked about commitments and I, you know, we talk about agreements all the time. So I'd love to kind of dive into to that side of things because we we actually got a, a question from a, an audience member this morning prior to the the episode. I don't know if we've got Howard Pearl here. Howard Pearl, if you're here, go ahead and give us a shout out in the chat. Um, but you had a very excellent question and it was work that you're currently running into a three day a week in the office and two days work from home. And you've noticed that you're getting emails from staff saying I'm sick, but I will work from home. Where do we stand from a company point of view in that if someone is too ill to come into the office on their allocated office day, should we allow this to be a work from home day or record it as sick? Anita, how, how would you respond to this, you know, keeping agreements in mind, like, and, and answering that? Yeah, I'm sure Howard's out for cocktail hour as it's nine o'clock in London town. So I hope you're having a good evening. Um, if we talk about what's happening at work, Howard, I think a lot of people are running into this. And so the first thing I think you need to do in this situation, Howard, is look at how you set it up. Were you absolutely explicit that this person needs to come in three days and stay home two days? Did you state which three days they needed to be in? And if the human is really legitimately sick, you and I don't want him in the office anyway. Vanessa and I were talking about this on our prep call. And, you know, finally, I was that evil person that would always work when I was sick in the office. You know, and COVID was the gift because I really got to stay home and be sick and not infect my coworkers, right? We don't want people to come in if they're legitimately sick. Now, what we want to know from you, Howard, is this a pattern that you're seeing from this team member? Is it Wednesdays they're supposed to be in and they're just never showing up on Wednesdays? Then the question is, I think, I, I actually think saying these are the days you need to be in and the days you need to be home are these days is antiquated. I'd like us to take the modern approach that says we're going to do some of the most impactful work on our product or with our customer or solving this problem and having your brain in the office to whiteboard with the rest of the team would make a big difference for us. So can you team member, you know, team member Tom, can you come into the office and, and participate with us on these things? And I think that's the evolution that we need to get to, but it requires a lot more from us as leaders to really get all of that set up and planned for. So I have some more questions for you, but number one, look at yourself, were you explicit? Number two, did you share the reason and the impactful work that this team member would do? And number three, if they're legitimately sick, let them stay home. And, and if they're having performance issues outside of that, would love to get your thoughts on, on another episode or in the Slack channel and we'll work through it with you in there. That's awesome. And I and I love Michelle's question. Are sick employees productive at home or in, in office? And Anita, how would you what what's your response to that? If you're, I'm really like, I'm hard on this. If I find out you're sick and you're working, I'm paired off. If you're sick, I want you to be home in bed and I want you to get well. Because if you continue to work and serve our customers and do our things, you're only going to prolong your sickness. Just be sick. Just stay home, be sick, and come back when you're well. And and I think a piece of that too is creating that that level of 
transparency with employees to help them feel safe. Like they can say that and say, yes, I'm not feeling well. Can I take a few hours off? Because if it becomes a toxic, hostile environment, you might have people working themselves to death. And so it's really like opening up that conversation to allow that trust. It does. And this is when, like, especially if you're running up against deadlines or let's say, you know, they're on a support team and they have so many tickets to cover, that's where you really want to be proactive. And you say, hey, I'm sick today. I'm not going to be available. How have you set yourself up to accommodate for that? Who else can pinch hit? Um, for you, right? Who else can come in? Like, now I know that if I'm sick on one of these calls, Vanessa can do it. This is what I was doing. This is my backup plan, right? Where you have people on your team that you can count on to help each other out. That's what we're supposed to be doing is helping each other out. But doing it in the moment is really hard. Um, I always like to say at the moment that I'm going to retire on a beach, not get hit by a bus. That's a common saying. Like, who do you have available and ready to come in and take your place. And as leaders and as teammates, especially through COVID, we've learned that's something we need to do. That's part of leadership. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so what are some changes companies could consider to really build a more productive hybrid work environment? And and what kinds of questions should leaders ask themselves as they're trying to elevate a hybrid work culture from good to great? Yeah, so this is one of our values going from good to great. It's a Jim Collins term. As you all know, I'm a huge fan. And I think there's a number of things that we can do. First is define what hybrid means for your organization. Um, Be specific about it. What is it and what is it not? You could just keep a Google sheet where you craft those things and you talk about what's working, what's not. And once a quarter, your leadership team gets together and say, hey, what adjustments do we want to make? How are you as a leader demonstrating your commitment to hybrid, right? Are you in the same consistent spot all the time? Are you showing up ready to work? I mean, I always hate those leaders that are coming in hot from their workouts and they're not ready and they're like, oh, sorry, I'm just jumping on a call, right? Like if you're hybrid and you're on a Zoom call, come in ready to work. If you're supposed to be in person, come in and be ready to work. And then the other thing I'm curious about is how many of you have had a leadership training on remote leadership? Has anyone done it? I would love to know if you have a good one. I'd love to attend, right? But how much time have we spent educating our team members and leaders on what great remote leadership looks like? I think that could be something that would really benefit us. So there's a few out there. It'd be great to have those um, those resources. If you've been through one, you'd recommend in, in the Slack channel so we can all be a part of it. And then how are we, you know, continuing to iterate? How are we capturing data through our well-being surveys, through our, you know, engagement surveys? Is hybrid working for you? Is it not? And what changes and adjustments would you like us to make? I like how you you talked about, uh, you kind of mentioned a little bit of like having good intentions, like with the yeah. leaders, like having that intention with those meetings. Because if we brought anything out of the pandemic, it was Zoom fatigue, Yes. And like, that's a major topic all on its own. And, you know, what, what has been your experience with that specifically? Hey, are you asking? Cause you know, I'm, I am a huge zoom fatiguer. Um, <laughs> like I, I can do 75% of capacity that I can do in person on zoom. Um, so like if I'm, I'm in person, I can just be super present and go all day. If you put me on 10 hours of zoom calls, I am struggling by the end of the day. So, I mean, I've got my special glasses, they're blue light. I've got my multiple screens. I've got my little space heater. I've got all the things, but missing the real life interaction is a big challenge for me. And so I work as much as I can to design two days in the office and make them all in person. I do not want to be on Zoom calls while I'm in office um, face-to-face. And then my Zoom days are lighter. Um, They're not as action-packed. And I couple that with some real heads down strategic work that I want to get done. And I'm really thoughtful about getting outside. I'm really thoughtful about probably ending earlier than I would in an in-person day and being more prepared. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting how many studies had come out around how much energy we're using to just read the nonverbal cues alone in a video call. And you hear the, the studies all the time saying you're mostly looking at yourself, paying attention to, okay, do I look like I'm engaged? If I look to the side, it's going to look like I'm not engaged. I'm checking the Slack channel. And when it's like, no, I just need a moment to like move my face to refocus for a second. It's almost like the in Toy Story 2, 
you at the very end when Barbie, the flight attendant's just like, you know, bye-bye, bye-bye now. And then she's like, can I stop smiling? Sometimes it feels like that, like that's straight up Zoom fatigue. <laughs> you think they got that scene out of the SNL one where they're like, bye-bye, bye-bye. Like do you think <laughs> Toy Story adapted it out of SNL? Like you're going to hear all right. That would be hilarious. Can I, can I just turn off my face for now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the other thing we talked about on our prep call that I miss a ton is just the straight up old fashioned phone call. Like, I don't know about y'all, but I get so distracted. You know, if I'm just on a regular zoom with a ton of people, I want to multitask and I don't want to pay attention. If I do that same call. Yeah. Some of you in the chat are feeling that way too. If I'm on the same call, especially where there's like 30 people on the zoom, I'd much rather just be on my phone and I would rather go for a walk. You'll get 10 X the productivity out of me with that than trying to compete with all these smiling faces on zoom. Yeah, you said, I, I don't know if anybody's ever felt this, but sometimes you just need to take a minute and just like turn off your camera just for even just two minutes to, you know, just breathe and calm your facial muscles because after a while it just, they feel sore because you're so focused on just one part of your body to give all the cues and to give all the attention to. So well, let's I, thank you for accepting my movie reference. <laughs> so, so I want to ask this open-ended question to the audience is what are some of the biggest wins or missteps you've seen as organizations adopt a hybrid approach? Yeah, we want to hear some good doozy stories. Like what are, you know, and I want the good things too, but you know, if you've seen a giant misstep, we can all learn from that. Yeah. Spill the tea. This is the place to do it. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. This is a good one, especially as we talk about global, global teams. We struggled with this a lot in a past life of, you know, thinking everybody's nine to five on, you know, PST, Pacific Standard Time or Eastern Standard Time, right? Not acknowledging um, team members around the world in different time zones. I think that was a challenge I experienced even before COVID and it even got worse through COVID for sure not facilitating the meeting so people in the Hollywood squares are left out from those in the room. You know, this is, I really like this comment because I really am a believer that you're either all in the squares or you're all in the room. And if you're, if you have half the team that is on site in person somewhere, I think you all go get in a room, a uh, separate room. Sorry. So you have your own square. We've done that before at Bamboo where we've just gone to our own rooms and done the meeting from the square to be respectful to those that are, are remote. And I think that's, that's one of the things. No and there's child also like technology with that too, where, you know, we have some meetings that it'll zoom in on every person within the room. Yes. And and it, it, it helps with that engagement there. It really does. Having the, having the right technology is a big piece of the commitment to hybrid that I think has, you know, been overlooked by some organizations. So you don't have to be a technology company to have great tech. And if you're really committed to hybrid, going through and doing an inventory of how are we going to set up our systems and our rooms and our at-home offices to be successful in it is really important. Mm -hmm. How, how have companies compensated those who are working on-site full-time to make it equitable with those who work from home and save on those costs? We are struggling with that. You know, that that's that's interesting. I'd be curious more specifically what, what, you're, what you're chatting about there, Allison. Is that more about um, gas prices or, you know, you're saving on commute time for sure? Um, so I'd love to hear more what, what you're thinking of there. But I also, um, you know, I think my broad statement answer to that, Allison, is that everyone, and especially in a hybrid work environment, has some form of choice, right? So if I'm choosing to go in, I believe that's the way that I work best in some meetings. I'm going to just do that, and I'm going to do it for the sake of the team. Um, I, I think if you try to make everything equitable around gas and time and commute and all of those things, you'll be on a losing battle. That's where a lot of companies have instituted, hey, here's your work from home stipend. Here's the things we cover. Here's the things we don't. We'll look at it once a year and make adjustments as we need it to be. Otherwise, if you don't get into a cadence like that, you'll be fighting every month or every week on the one off that somebody wants to, to feel included on. And it's, it's, you'll never win on that battle and you'll never give enough of a stipend. Everybody always wants more. 
Mm-hmm. When I think that's that's one of the things that gets missed with hybrid versus remote and like uh, what not hybrid versus remote, but in hybrid in general, like sometimes it's a, it's a decision of like, you know, for a while during the pandemic, you felt like you had to have so many meetings to create social connections and hybrid creates an opportunity for those so- social connections and that bonding with employees. Um, so you have to ask yourself and be intentional with the types of meetings that you're actually scheduling. Does this need to be a meeting or am I just creating this just because I want to have a conversation with somebody like being intentional with the boundaries of that? It's so important. There was just a post from Adam Grant over the weekend where he says the number of meetings have increased incrementally, um, a really impactful number that I don't have off the top of my head. And so, you know, he said meetings are for decisions, for bonding, or to do things. He had one other, but those were the three that I remember. And I thought that's so impactful that we really, that's the importance of leadership and designing an agenda, making sure that you have the people there that can make the decisions. I'm a big fan of making decisions in meetings. I'm not a fan of read out and and absorb. If you want me to read something, I can do that on my own time. I don't need to do it in a meeting. Let's get together to work a problem or to make a decision. And so this is the piece around leadership really needs to step up. And we as people and HR leaders can be an amazing demonstration of this, you know, just do your own self inventory. Do you have agendas for all your meetings? Are you spending time preparing for all those meetings? Do you know what role you have to play? Um, You know, otherwise, I'm a big fan of not taking meetings if I don't know what role I'm going to play. Otherwise, like, let me know how I can contribute to you. What kind of impact can I make? And I'll be there for you. But if I don't know what that is, then I'll probably choose to work on some other work. And I think we have to be honest about those things. Yeah, which is totally fair. I think that's yeah. fair. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a, a really good question from Virginia. Uh, she said, Virginia said, are employees that are fully remote are having issues being engaged and motivated? I've had several do a quiet quitting by only doing forward facing or highly visible tasks, but not doing the essential back end functions or tasks. This is, this is a big one. And that's where I think leadership is so, so critical. So are we having conversations around this? Are we saying like, Hey, what could we do to have you be more engaged? Do we need to do more breakout rooms? You know, Slack has the huddles that you can get together in. I know when I'm working on big projects with remote teams, sometimes we just stay on zoom and we're just there if we need each other. Right. So you have your camera shut off, but you're there together so you can ask questions and interact. I think that's really where you've got to get the team together and say, are we all focused on the same things? Are we driving towards this outcome? Do we see how this outcome makes a big difference in our overall strategy that we're driving to? And are we all committed to it? And um, and really help the team member take some accountability and ownership for their own level of engagement. Right. I think sometimes in people in HR, we all feel like it's on us to create everything for all the people. And at times, you know, the people have to step up and say, hey, to be more engaged, I could really use this, this or this, or I could really use partnership here or mentorship here. And let's have those conversations. Um, So I think there's a lot we could do there to help them become more engaged for sure. And really partnering with the leader to, to take the first steps in those conversations. Yeah, you you kind of answered, uh, I think it was Natalie. Natalie said, in-office staff, staff assume at home individuals are not working. The assumption is they're doing laundry, going on walks, take, taking care of dogs, kids, and in return, the expectation response time is off the charts. And so I love that you were saying, set those expectations. Do we all agree to what that looks like and, and holding that accountability? Yeah, especially if they're working in a job to say like, hey, do we all agree that uh, eight hour response time is reasonable? Like that's a great topic in a team meeting. What should our response time be on Slack? What should our response time be on email? And are we sending up our emails in Slacks to generate that type of response? That's why I always like to look at myself first. If someone didn't respond to me in the timeline that I thought they should respond, I always say, did I ask them to? Was I super explicit that I needed it back at this time? You know, I'll even put if I'm doing email and I need it back within a certain time frame, I put request in all caps, request for response in 24 hours. And I'll follow up with them and say, can you get me a response in the 24 hours? Because if it's really critical for me to move forward and I need that roadblock removed, I'm going to take responsibility for making sure I get what I need to deliver my thing. I'm not going to just assume that they know what they're doing, right? 
So even in the Slack, you can do that to the group and say, hey, I need an answer on this by this time. If you can't give me the answer, this is the direction I'm going in. If you can't get behind it, then reach out and let me know. But this is where this bus is going. And so that's like this up-level version of communication, whether you're hybrid or remote, even in person. Hey, we struggled with all these same things in person. It just got more complex now with this hybrid remote complexity. So let's be super explicit on what we need and what success looks like. Yeah. Well, that's a tactic tactic that you taught me was when we put, I want this by end of day, my version of end of day could be completely different than everybody else in the group. One person, it could be four o'clock. The other person could be one o'clock. It could be midnight, five o'clock. And so being very specific so people know what they're agreeing to. And I like how you said pivot it to where if they can't agree to that, then tell them here's the other direction or here's what you can do if you can't. I, I love that that idea. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Vanessa. I mean, you all know with little kids, I put the kids to bed at 830 and then I get on and I do work until I'm done working. So my end of day is often 11 o'clock uh, Mountain Standard Time, you know, but if that doesn't work for you, then let me know and I'll get it in a different way. So um, it's it's important to be specific. When you bring up a pretty interesting topic too, of like work-life balance doesn't need to be a very specific thing. It could look different for other people. And that's what's so great about this, this flexible hybrid model is that you can have that flexibility. Definitely. I mean, a lot of you know that I don't believe in balance. I don't think it's possible. I am a big fan of work-life harmony and there's going to be times where I'm more focused on life and there's times where I'm more focused on work and they ebb and flow and they get together. But the thing that governs that kind of my internal governor are the things that I've agreed to as my commitments around being, you know, a leader and around being a mom and around being a friend and around being a wife. And so as long as I'm clear around what success looks like in my relationships, then I can set that up in an ebb and flow situation and it works out really well. And look, it's not perfect and it's not clean all the time. It's a good, it's a good match of like a hot mess at times. And that's why it's important to be super clear on what is possible and what's not possible. I mean, oftentimes the girls will ask me, hey, can you do French braids for me this morning? And the answer is, hey, I can't do them today and I'd be happy to do them for you tomorrow, right? So um, just, just setting boundaries everywhere and being clear on what you can and can't do has been a big recipe for success for me. Yeah. Setting those healthy boundaries in, in that whole like work-life integration is important and yes. setting those appropriate boundaries helps you be successful and creates a much more healthy working environment. It does. It does. And no one's going to do it for you. Like one of the best pieces of advice I always got was, hey, the job will be there and it'll always take everything you have, everything. So the work is always going to be there. You have to decide when and how you're going to come in and impact it the most. And just know that it's it's the thing that will ask everything of you. And so if you don't set up a different boundary system, the work will never give it to you. That is true. <laughs> and and one of the things, uh, Kimberly posted a win Uh Kimberly said, our team proved to our leadership team that we didn't miss a beat for two years. This also generated the fact to allow us the opportunity to go to a hybrid schedule when we return to in-person. This is awesome. That's awesome. And I'm guessing what you did in this scenario is you set up real strong outcomes, right? Hey, let's sample this. I mean, you can get me to try about anything for 90 days if I understand what the outcome is going to be. So let's make sure that we really articulate, hey, this team wants to work this way. This is what we're going to deliver. This is what we're going to do to get it done. And if we make it successful, are you game? And that that's, that's a real powerful way to lead through different things that you want to create in your work. Yeah. Well, how would you rep uh, respond to Corey? Corey says, I've been working on setting up team norms and getting the team to sign off on them. What time the team what time the team is expected to be working core hours? We cover phones, communicating with each other through teams, but the one challenge is engagement in virtual meetings. So what would your advice be in like creating much more of that engagement when you do have to be virtual? Yeah, it's a great question. So if everybody's agreed to the norms, maybe one of the norms in virtual meetings is that we all have our cameras on and we're all in a location where we can be focused on work. 
And um, so make that one of your norms, make the engagement of the virtual piece, like where you have outlined things to be responsible for in the meeting and make sure everyone has a role in the meeting. Again, like, is everybody there to solve a problem? Is everybody there to make a decision? What are the roles everybody has to play? And I mean, this is where it's much bigger lift on leaders to engage everyone. I mean, a remote is a great way to include all voices because you have chat and you have also verbally. And so as a leader, making sure like, hey, um, you know, Stephanie, you haven't said anything all meeting. Is there anything you'd want to add to us in the chat? If you know that Stephanie usually doesn't speak out, you know, on camera and asking everybody, hey, for this one hour, this is our virtual time together. We'd love to see all your faces. Please join us in, and let's see all your faces on camera. And we you know we only do this for five hours a week or whatever it is. And so during those five hours, we want you to be here and be present. And then one, one thing I learned in a different uh, life was somebody would always bring a new question to the meeting. I was just looking to see if I had one on my desk, but like, just ask a question. What was the strangest food you ever ate? And so the whole team would open up and share something that they learned about each other, um, you know, from that question. And that's a really great way to build camaraderie, build community. But again, you've got to be super intentional about what you're doing. I, I love this. Yes. Question of the day in teams and get people to share because those are those water cooler conversations that we're all missing. There's actually an icebreaker question generator on Google. So if what? anybody, yes, that's what my squad does. And it's the funnest thing <laughs> because <Awesome>. it's random. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So if anybody ever wants to look that up it just type in Google icebreaker question generator, it'll, it'll, be awesome. But I love, I love that because it kind of brings up more conversations and, and even just having that open conversation with the team and saying, Hey, let's call it the elephant in the room. This is going to be a really long meeting over virtual. And, you know, we want to break this up. If there's a few minutes within the meeting that you just need to turn your camera off because you need to just do a refocus. If you need to look off to the window because you just need to stop looking at the camera, it is okay. Sometimes just even speaking that out loud to let your team know, I care about you and your ability to like be present in this meeting. And hey, these things are, are difficult and different than in person and it's okay. Then you create that safe space. I love this, Vanessa. Like just letting everybody know, hey, it's okay to turn off your camera. It's okay to get up and walk around. Um, it's okay to turn it off and just be like, hey, I need five minutes just to get up and walk. Like, but demonstrate that too. As the leader, be the one doing those things. Like, so now I've started taking just phone calls when everybody else is on Zoom and it tests me a little bit. I'm like, oh, I'm the only person doing this. Like, should I be doing this? But I know that I'm really contributing and I make sure the times I contribute are meaningful. I'll turn my camera off. I mean, Vanessa sees, I'll change my background. I'll get up and I'll walk around. I'll make coffee or tea, depending on where I am in my house. Right. Um, and so showing that you can have that freedom and flexibility while you're on the call makes a big difference. I love that Tammy, uh, how you said, I agree with Melissa. I think people work better remotely and others are better in a uh, work environment it is important to be honest about who you are. The goal is productivity. 100%. That's a, that's a good statement. It is. It is. But that's the thing is that we need team members to be honest about what works for them. And then we need to be honest about how it changes right? Like we didn't know we'd have Zoom fatigue to the level that we do. We didn't know the things that we would, need, we would need, right? In this space. And so continuing to step up and say, hey, this is what works for me. This is what doesn't work for me is, is a conversation. It's a great staple to have in your one-on-ones, maybe once a month, just to say like, hey, um, how's it going? How's this remote culture going for you? How's this hybrid culture working for you? What else do you need to be successful? Yes. When I, uh, so who said that? Elise, how do managers measure productivity well in a hybrid setting? That's a good question. Outcomes. Outcomes. Like, I, actually, I, I love this question because it's not any different than we measured productivity in an in-person setting. And managers, if we're super honest, have been struggling with this no matter what the setting. So, right, if I'm going to hire this role, what are the outcomes that this role is going to generate? right? Like that's what we want to do before we hire. And then we bring in this warm body and what is this warm body going to generate as far as outcomes go? And are we tracking to that? 
And if you can't clearly identify it, maybe you don't need the role or maybe the role has changed or shifted. So I really want to be sure that we are not kind of putting a bandaid on, oh, it's because we're remote or hybrid. I really want to look at the role and the work to be done and the outcomes generated from the role and make sure that you've got a scoreboard for success. What does winning look like? What is not? What does losing look like? You know, how do you make sure that you're progressing in these in these these different phases of growth through the job? Yes. And you, you hit on like a really important topic when you're, when you're talking with candidates that are coming to your company, you've got to make sure that they understand and agree to the outcomes that they're joining into, because if they're not fully bought in to that expectation or agreement and agreement, then they're going to come in and not be successful or, or feel like, oh, wow, this isn't what I expected. You know, you have to be very transparent from the get-go so they know exactly what it does look like, whether that's the job outcomes, what to expect in the work environment, and you know what does the, the model expectations look like? What does that flexibility look like? What is the work-life uh, harmony? I love that word. What does that work-life harmony look like? Because that could be, that can always look different for different types of roles. So you've got to be honest as a hiring team of what does this really look like for them as much as what we're looking for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because then they'll know if they want to sign up. I think a lot of people have got kind of the short end of the stick going into new jobs during this whole time, right? Everybody, we've been in this great resignation. I think the pendulum is swinging back now, but everybody needed warm bodies so much. They were big yes people, right? I don't know if you saw this, Vanessa, in the recruiting world, right? Yes, we have this. Yes, we'll do that. Yes, it'll be great. Yes, our culture is awesome. We just need you to start. And then this poor person starts this job and none of those things are that way. And so I love a great survey question, you know, three months, six months, a year post hire, is this job everything you thought it would be? Why or why not? Um, it's really informative to our, our top of funnel process from a brand standpoint and all through our recruiting process. Yeah, because that's that's a huge miss when recruiting teams and hiring teams aren't aligned. And one of the things that I, I love, every recruiter on our team is required once a month to, to do a new hire intake survey with meeting with somebody and they're asking them questions around that of like was this everything you expected do you have any feedback on the onboarding or hiring process and there's been multiple times since I've been here through the years where we've been uh, miscommunicating a certain topic that we're like oh we were misaligned there was a last lack of communication here let's fix it let's create alignment let's you know reconfigure what we are looking for and and it helps really build that that true partnership within and that trust within the company between leaders. It does. It makes a big difference when you can do that and constantly learn and evolve. Like oftentimes in HR, we get afraid to change things, change it. Like, why are we so committed to these things that we've always done? Most of them don't work anymore. So it's okay. Just change it up. Yes. Change is good. <laughs> Change is good. And, and hybrid work definitely changes the way that we do approach a lot of things. So we do have to be very adaptable and flexible in this new uh, norm. I hate that word, but that's the only word I can think of right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the, the big questions that, that I've been seeing a lot from a couple people is how do you keep company culture and keep I'm everyone connected? There. connected? Yeah. Yeah, so company culture lives in the values and how we treat each other, right? Like it's really in, you know, we talked about our own bamboo value of going from good to great in this session, but every conversation, every team meeting, every one-on-one, -on -one, every town hall, how are you integrating the vision and mission into everything that you're doing? Um, you know, this is, this is, you know, one of my core tenants and how to build, build culture and it shows up in the work. So how do you tie the work back into those pieces? And, and people like you, you never hear, um, oh, I love my job because, you know, um, the snack wall is so great or the t-shirt I got last month is really comfortable. You hear, I really love the people. I love doing these webinars with Vanessa and with Damien and with Sarah and with Amanda. And it's why we do this every two weeks and we commit our time to it because I love this team that puts together these HR unplugged webinars. And I love all of you. I love our chat. 
And that's what makes it fun. So it has nothing to do about the snacks. I don't have any snacks. It has nothing to do with the t-shirt, right? It has to do with the people and culture lives inside the people. So do what you can to build those relationships through the work that we get to do together. I love that because there's kind of this empowering ownership for each individual within a company to say, this is the culture I believe in. And I want to be, you know, what is your personal brand? Like, what is the personal brand that you have at your own company? And, you know, for like, that could be down to every nitty gritty detail, but how do you treat other people within the org? How are your interactions? How do you present yourself? One of the, the best conversations I actually had with you, Anita, when you, for one of the first conversations we had where it's, you know, you talked about like, I want to make sure every time I meet with people, they get the same Anita and not different versions. And sometimes I think that can be so easy for us is that we have this remote of emotions or personal things and we get triggered. Like somebody presses a button and we're just a completely different persona and we're not on brand. And it's like, hey, no, how are you on brand and helping other people? We all have individual things going on and different emotions that we're, you know, going through. So how are we controlling, you know, how we're presenting and how we're treating each other in creating that really good, inclusive and inviting environment together? It's, it's so critical, you know, consistent leadership has been something I've worked on for a long time. And it's something that I have mapped out in my own personal vision is that I consistently show up um, for the teams and the people that I'm working with. And that way it centers me and who I want to be every day and every interaction and every meeting and all of those things. So having, having that centering thought, I think is, is really critical and an important piece to who do you want to be as a leader? How do you want to show up? And, um, you know, I just learned um, as I'm, you know, I'm constantly as a parent of two girls, they're um, soon to be eight and 10. Did you know you go through adolescence between the age of 10 and 26 now? It can be what? anywhere in that range. Yes. This I'm is learning so many things today. <laughs> I know, I know. So, you know, since I'm just what a year out of adolescence, um, <laughs> so, but like as you talk about these different emotions, Vanessa, it's really important just to call them out and to recognize the impact of them. And, um, you know, there's going to be days where you aren't that consistent leader and that's okay. It's how do you come and show up and clean it up? Like Vanessa, I wasn't who I wanted to be for you yesterday. I got a little like frustrated with the situation and I just want to own that I wasn't showing up in the spirit of my values back to creating the culture, right? I wasn't meeting you where you were and I wasn't assuming positive intent, right? Two of Bamboo's values. And this is what you can count on me going forward because part of the consistency is the cleanup. So don't feel like you have to be, you know, perfect all the time either. Yes. That's, and that's a good point is, is to be okay with imperfection yes. and to own it and own those moments and hybrid and remote work, bring out all those imperfections, right? <laughs> yeah. right? They're kind of like this, this, this zoom is this giant magnifying glass on everything that's wrong with me. Right. And everything that I, you know, it takes a lot more to do it this way. So feel free to, to give yourself a break in it too. Mm-hmm. Well, there's one last point on, on this, this conversation I, I wanted to make was uh, Pam was talking about they have a team member that won't turn their camera on during the one hour meeting. I actually want to share kind of a vulnerable story that I went through is yeah. I, I was actually presenting to, to our, our team and I, I noticed that there was one individual that wasn't on the entire time. And I was a little bit offended because everybody else was on, this person wasn't on. And I ended up messaging them afterwards and said, hey, was there a reason why your camera was off during that meeting? And they, it turns out that they had some personal health problems and it was something bigger. And so I had to kind of let go of me and say, okay, these are humans. Um, and, and not saying that that's your situation, Pam, but just kind of seeing like, maybe there's something else behind the scenes going on and having that conversation of like, hey, are you doing okay? Because, you know, having, it's it's all about that crucial conversation and stating the facts, stating the observations and saying, this is the story I'm telling myself. And that's why I did to that person. I said, here's the facts, your camera's off. 
And as I observe this, this is how it's making me feel. I'm feeling it's very disengaged and what I'm saying isn't content that's important to you. Can you, can you chat with me about this? And it turned into a really good conversation with this person. And, uh, you know, they're, they're very open. And so it's, it's kind of opening that up to see if there's something else. I love that, Vanessa. It's so vulnerable. Thank you for sharing that because it is, I care about you and I want to know if you're okay. And look, there's some days in the spirit of my commitment to being consistent that I won't use my camera. Like if I don't feel like I can show up and be my best self, then I'm going to, um, I'm going to stay committed to consistency. And there's some times where I've had team members that are going through things and they just need that, that, that solace. And so Vanessa, I love it after not while, you know, everybody's on the zoom, but reaching out and just saying, Hey, I'm just checking in. How are you doing? Do you want to jump on a phone call? I uh, just want to make sure, you know, check in and see how your day is goes a long way. And it's really yeah. beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. well, let's, yeah. let's talk about, we, we've got a, a few minutes here. Um, so, so we want to, it looks like we're moving to kind of just a, a, a wrap up here. So uh, the final thoughts is the hybrid work environment likely won't be going away now that we've all seen a lot of good work that can be done at home too. So Anita, do you have any final thoughts for HR leaders looking towards the future of hybrid work? Yeah, so I would say first, define your why, why hybrid work is going to be important for you and what it looks like when it's successful. So those are the two pieces I give you as a final thought and a takeaway to get into action on. The third one is to make sure your leadership supports it. And you can start, I just did this with our offsite two weeks ago, get your leaders in a room and say, where do you thrive? Ask the same question that we asked all of you. Where do you thrive? How do you do your best work? How does your team do your best work? And use that as some of the design principles to go forward. Some of our principles at Bamboo is that we think hybrid creates a greater sense of belonging. We think it gives everyone a chance to be heard and work in the way that's best for them and therefore setting people free to do great work. It recognizes that both in-person and remote are valuable and it gives people the flexibility they need to be set free in their life. So that's why we centered there. It's directly tied to our mission and our values and how we operate. So that would be my fourth final thought is tie it back into your existing mission statement and value statement. So one, define it. Two, get leadership involved. Three, set it to motion with your values and mission and, and iterate. That's the fourth thing. Look at the data, change it, evolve it the way you need to as you go forward. And, and don't be afraid to, to say, hey, we messed this up and we're going to change it and we're going to do better, right? Just acknowledge what works and what doesn't and, and keep going. You all are doing great work out there. Thanks, Anita. Those are, that's a great wrap up. Um, so any, it looks like we've got just a, a few minutes for maybe an, an audience question. So open Q and A. <laughs> um, what do you, what would you, how would you respond to this question is our employees don't want to come into the office even one day a week. How can we incentivize them to do so and make sure leadership is still happy with the schedule? Go back and share with them the problem they're going to solve by coming in that one day. So don't have them come in just to come in, have them come in to do something awesome, something that they're going to remember, something that's going to create connection. Um, maybe it's a, you know, more of a corporate event around your mission and values. Maybe it's a product update. Maybe it's a customer story. Maybe it's just an event where the team members are getting together and are able to connect together. Maybe it's working on solving a bug or some big customer issue, but create something for them to do together. Because I know if I'm just going to go in to be on Zoom calls, I don't want to go in. If you want to really use my brain and we get to problem solve around something, I'll be there for you anywhere. I'll fly there for you. So like, like you've got to do more than just say, come in the office. There's definitely got to be a reason. Why am I going in? <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Anita. Um, it looks like we're let's, let's wrap up. Let's wrap up. So Sarah put in the chat, thanks for joining us today. We want to see you again for episode 10 on October 18th, the big one zero. So don't miss us for celebrating our, our 10th birthday, the Learn Hearts with Vanessa. She taught me how to do that. I didn't know how to do that before. 
We're going to be discussing how to provide a clear vision to drive engagement and performance. One of the toughest topics I still struggle with driving performance in organizations and coming up with something that works. So you'll get to hear all the nitty gritty and what works and what doesn't work on October 18th. Also, we're going to be hosting our first industry-specific HR Unplugged. It's called HR Unplugged Out on the Field. It's about the trades, focusing on construction and other industries where team members are working outside the office or the home. And that's going to be on October 19th. So that week, we're back-to-back, -back, October 18th and 19th. And we can't wait to be with you all again. Here is our survey. So please give us your thoughts and reactions. Tell us what you want more of. Tell us what you want less of. You can't hurt our feelings, so please let us know what's working. Always love being with you, Vanessa. Thanks for hosting today, and you all have a super week. Keep doing the great work. We're grateful for all that you're doing to keep people happy out there all over the world. Great to see you all.